Hey guys, I am DM Zone. This is Gamers Oasis. Let's talk about some brown stones. Okay, so actually the correct pronunciation is Bronstein. Uh, Brownstone is the English translation of it. There's also a Latin translation that was used. Um, there is a brown stone, but that is an Americanized version of this um, with cowboys and Indians. But I'll get into maybe some of that a little bit later. Okay, so where I've kind of pulled all this information from is from a PDF I bought off of uh, RPGDriveThru.com, okay, or DriveThruRPG.com. The link will be down below. Um, it's not the actual one that came out in like 1968 or whatever it was, but it is a reprinting, uh, re-envisionment, I guess you could say, under uh, the discussion or in, while well, in discussion with Dave, with Major Dave Wesley, who is the person who invented the game back in the day. Um, it was never that formalized, I believe. It would be the correct way of wording that back in the day. It was more something they couldn't really find the market for, per se. So it was never brought to market in that way, though it was played a lot and inspired a lot of gameplay that did go to market. I think that's a good way to look at it. Um, there's also an interview with uh, Mr. with Major uh, Wesley, um, and there is a website that of a person who's played many Bronstein games, um, and that's also down there. Mr. Ars uh, Luda uh, played in several Bronstein games, and he basically blogged or talked about his experiences. And um, I'm going to recommend you go to all these things and check that out. So I'm not going to pull completely off of that. Um, in this particular one, I'm just going to be talking about each one of these as they kind of relate to each other in my own personal experience with how I think these things relate. Okay, this is going to be a long video either way. Also, one more thing before I get too much farther. Um, we almost don't have D&D &D the way we know it now because of an accident where Major Wesley almost kills Dave Arneson in real life. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Okay, so we'll go ahead and talk about that in a bit. Okay, guys, so let's just jump straight into this. Uh, Bronstein is one of the first, if not the absolute first, uh, role play games as we know it. Um, technically, and I'm going to go into this just a little bit, there are two other forms of what they were calling role play games. Um, one is uh, that the one the psychologists use to talk about. Uh, like a way to uh, dissociate from your problem so you could talk about it in like a third person and the character you're talking about would have the problem and then these two characters would resolve their problems to try and work through some stuff. And this was a technique that some psychologists were using. Also, the other one that was primarily going on at this time was uh, actor actors would uh, do this little training regiment where they would have two people, for example, if you ever watch the Monte Python uh, tea shop or whatever it's called, where you have the owner of a tea shop and then you have a customer at the tea shop uh, in a skit and they're going back and forth with each other, basically showing uh, the wit of the actors in this. And they are going to go, uh, and instead of selling tea, uh, which would be logical, the customer is trying to buy cheese from the tea shop. So uh, the rules are this, uh, the, the, first, the customer, the first actor A, uh, is going to go ahead and ask actor B, the shop owner, uh, for a type of cheese. This shop owner has to refuse him uh, without repeating himself. And the uh, actor A has to ask for a different type of cheese without repeating himself or herself. And this goes back and forth until one of them repeats themselves and then they go ahead and they have a victor and it's a, a sort of a game of fun, shall we say. Another uh, time Monte Python did this skit uh, was with the Dead Parrot skit. And if you haven't seen that one, I recommend it. I personally knew that one before I did this research and I really loved it. I'd heard the other one. But it was kind of like, oh, I don't understand why they're asking for cheese in a tea shop. Now I get it, um, and that makes a lot more sense. So now we have that little bit of framework. Let's go ahead and move forward. So back in the day, uh, you had war games. It was A versus B, Team A versus Team B, very static. Everything is traditional. Everything is forward. Uh, with what uh, 
Wesley was trying to do, Major Wesley, was he was trying to say, okay, well, what? why can't guerrilla forces be involved? Why can't civilians be mixed up into this? Why can't an institution or um, a mayor have influence over a conflict in their own village or city or town? Why, why are these things never in the fights? There's historical documents where generals have gone after generals on their own team to eliminate competition, and that has cost them wars and stuff like that, or commanders or whatever, not necessarily generals, but you get the general idea. So the way that uh, Wesley was wanting to do this was he wanted to have um, more than just a general, and you plan it from the general's perspective and you're moving troops. He wanted to have people be involved and they all have their own goals their own concepts their own positives negatives these type of things their own motivations and it, he wanted to play the battle before the battle and the the french went to go uh, sack the prussian city of bronstein they had the the what happened in before you know like the, they're coming they're what do we do do we build this bridge do we build this fortification do we hide our troops do we attack them before they attack us. Do we set up defensive, you know, like all these things that go on. Um, and this was kind of like what he wanted to play was the battle before the battle. Um, and I'll get into how that worked the first time in a, in a second. So in the process of doing this, David Wesley, uh, Major Wesley, ended up uh, creating several new things. For example, he created the referee. Uh, he now refers to it as it could be a, a, a GM or a game master if you want to use a more generalized term. But back then they were called referees. And the reason why we, I keep calling him Major Wesley is not because he played a major in game. Uh, normally that was actually a colonel if you were going to have a person making decisions like that. Uh, it was um, uh, because he was actually in the military and he went to Vietnam at one point in time later, which I'll get into when, in the timeline of uh, what sort of happened during these early times. So Major Wesley said that the first Bronstein was absolutely a total mess. Um, and there's a, <laughs> there's, a, there's a couple things here that are, uh, are like, there's, there's a, two different events that happened uh, that uh, Major Wesley talks about in his interview that if it wasn't for these two things or if these, these, if these two things didn't go as they went, um, we would not have gaming as we know it today. And this is computer games and uh, regular tabletop RPGs. Um, the first one was that President Johnson had made a declaration that anyone that was basically a month older than uh, Major Wesley was good to go, they can complete their graduate school. Anyone Major Wesley's uh, age or younger, like to the month, uh, was basically considered to be a no good draft dodger type of person, even if they're going to college. Um, and so many of Major Wesley's uh, friends and co colleagues that were in college were uh, forced to join the army or whatever and go to war um, in Vietnam uh, because they were this age, not because of any other factor. They, everyone is still going to graduate school. Everyone's still going for their master's degree. But because of their age, they, were, they had to leave school and go to join the service. Uh, Major Wesley said there was two people that didn't have to. He was one of them. The first one, actually, was uh, a gentleman who had already been in the Navy, had done his time, and came back out and then went to school. So since he had been once, uh, he had a waiver. Uh, Major Wesley had already signed up for the Army and was scheduled to go there as soon as he got done with his master's degree. So as soon as he got done with his master's, he went ahead and joined. And, I'll, and that was in 1971, and he was gone for three years, and he came back. And I'll talk about that again just in a second. But that's the reason why uh, a lot of this happened. Well, because of this, he felt very disenfranchised. He went through a little bit of a weak moment where he wasn't uh, the most motivated to do his schoolwork. So he sort of escaped into this realm of fantasy and whatnot and uh, really worked harder on this game that he came up with, this Bronstein game. And in this, he came up with what was the first battle. Uh, and he goes in, there's a, a well-documented history 
from Major Wesley's point of view that is based in reality and probably his interpretation of reality. I don't know how much fantasy there is in there, but maybe it's an alternate history or future or whatever. I don't know. Um, but essentially, uh, Bronstein was a castle in 1335, and then from there it became this thing. And I'm not going to talk about that a whole lot more. If you get the PDF, which is like $3.18 right now, um, go get that thing. In there, there's like a three-page history of Bronstein talking about why the stones are brown and why the water is brown and what it's called and where it is in position of the Rhine River and all this type of stuff. Uh, where it is in West Germany. All these things are discussed there. It's at the very end of the PDF. Um, it's worth a read. Uh, that by itself might be worth the $3.18. So highly recommend going to go get this book, um, if not for so many other reasons. Uh, but we'll get into that near the end of the video. Okay, so President Johnson creates this thing. Uh, he now is disenfranchised. He spends more time on it. He makes eight rolls eight characters uh, that are now in this position. I'm going to post some pictures up of the characters that he made uh, and this type of stuff. And, I'm, and I post both the 2008 version so you can see what it kind of evolu uh, evolved into. And I'm going to post one of the original characters. Now, all the original characters are there. Um, my recommendation is to go to the website that I have down below and you can see Mr. Luda's uh, uh, handouts for that if you look underneath memories and all that type of stuff it's worth exploring I want to give him credit so I'm not going to talk about any more about the original characters in there since he has them I'm going to let you guys go find that yourself he decides he's going to do this on a Christmas break when he goes back right one second he takes his eight characters he gets it all set up they're set up inside this uh, building. He has some room set up for he can do his little private discussions and all that. Told like three rooms. And people start showing up. People that aren't scheduled to be there are showing up. Ends up being 22 people. So he only came with eight characters, but now he has to make 14 more characters. So he literally doubled what he was trying to do. So people had these weird roles. Um, and they went off and did their things. The rounds were taking longer than expected and it wasn't the type of gameplay he was hoping for. Some people got bored and they got talking once they got a feel for how the game went. And they realized they could do a lot of this without him there. So they just continued to go and go and go and things were being done and he didn't have any idea and he felt very confused, a little baffled. He was almost at wit's end when two of his players barged into his little private area where he had things set up and said, okay, uh, he's challenging me to a duel. I'm a Prussian commander. I'm going to accept because I no way am I going to have some student or teacher or whatever challenge me to a duel and me not accept the duel. Major West like, I don't have rules for dueling. Give me a second. And so he had to come up with literally rules for dueling. Uh, one of the players that was issued, that, the one that issued the duel actually was uh, uh, Mr. Arneson, uh, Dave Arneson from the co-founder of Dungeons & Dragons, oddly enough. Uh, he was very much into these games and was one of the first people in the games. And he played some sort of like teacher that was a fencer. And uh, he ended up losing and being run through by uh, the Prussian commander and his character died. Now, that's not the death I'm talking about. The death I'm talking about where Dave Arson was almost killed by Wesley was actually a real-life death, not an in-character death, which is crazy. That, and I'll get to that in just a second. Okay, so in part of this battle, um, they, they had this thing set up, and they had a river going through it, and they wanted to go ahead and get across this river because where it was now, uh, Group B, the French, had uh, the guns within range of the river, but they were on higher ground, which means that they had the ability to hit the river and people crossing it and the conflict around the river and the lower ground, which is at the river, could not hit them back. So it gave them a superior advantage. Uh, so the first thought was, okay, the bridge has been taken out. We have to rebuild the bridge. How are we going to do this? They surveyed the, the grounds in the first uh, round of the combat 
and they saw this barn and they went to Mr. Uh, Major uh, Wesley and they said, okay, we want to tear down this barn and use the wood to make a bridge. Can we do that? And he said, absolutely. How many people are you going to put towards it? He came up with a number. They decided to go ahead and go for it. And they sent 12 people, an entire unit of people over there to tear down this barn and do it. Well, this took a while. And uh, it turns out this barn never actually got fully taken down and the bridge fully built throughout this whole thing. And it was kind of like wasted of 12 people doing stuff. They either need to put more into it or do something else. Um, and in the first battle, they didn't succeed in that. And it actually became so muddied because of all the side conversations and everyone not understand what's going on. And they ended up uh, not being able to score who won. And uh, the only thing I knew is some people died and some people were doing better than other people, but they couldn't actually come up with a winning side because uh, Major Wesley had no way to grade these things. So Major Wesley was very frustrated by the first one, but the players loved it. Um, and he went back and he thought about it. And the next break, he came back and he talked to fewer people and had four people come back and do the same adventure. This time they did the same type of thing. They had a little bit more working knowledge. They sent scouts out to look at the river, see if there was any place they could ford the river and cross it because they were thinking about the game while he was gone. They found out that in many places the river was only two feet deep, but the bottom was soft, which meant that you could take horses and foot troops across, but any uh artillery would become stuck so essentially the artillery could both fire onto the river and could have that combat there but you'd have to send cavalry or foot troops up to go after their cavalry up top just like unless you put your cavalry your, your artillery literally right there they would have to do the same thing to you which actually meant that there was not any reason to try and build a bridge uh, and they loved this little thing and in the future he said that instead of making it static he decided to make it a dice roll so where they went to scout it would be a dice six and then a one would be like one to two feet deep and a six would be deep so only uh, troops and horses could swim across they couldn't even walk across so they'd have to make some checks and there might be some casualties um, or and not necessarily deaths, but just maybe taken out because of exhaustion or because uh, they f couldn't make it and they went back to the first side. And there were some rules and that type of stuff that they could figure out with that type of And there was ways you could make it easier for your people to cross. This was sort of that uh, interaction that Wesley was trying to go for. However, the players really wanted that conflict between players. They really thrived on this back and forth and then being able to problem solve amongst themselves without having to use an arbitrator like the GM or the referee or what Major Wesley in this case. And it really kind of felt stilted and flat to them. So Major Wesley decided to go ahead and redesign it. He wanted to make the sides a little closer, a little bit more intermingled, shall we say. He wanted to have it a little bit different. So this time he made it in a, like a Latin America type of setting where they had Banana Republic. To, to quote him, it was uh, filled with secret police, student revolutions, corrupted treasury ministers, and El Jefe, the director himself. Um, what that was, was it was a, a place where you had more than Team A and Team B. Yes, you had those two teams, but then you had all these guerrilla troops or these special interest people or these people that had minerals or they had uh, drugs or they had shipments of whatever they're trying to get in and out merchants and that type of stuff and it allowed for more exploration and for deception between the players uh, where you could actually have spying and that type of stuff and it made for a much more interesting game the fourth uh, Braunstein was in a huge success. It was back to its original number type of things. And this is like uh, 1969 or so. And this went on, this was huge. And they had a couple more. Uh, and by 1971, uh, Major Wesley was wrapping things up with college and was getting ready to leave. And in that late fall time period, he got back with Dave Arneson and said to Mr. Arneson, he said, you know, I'm going to be gone, uh, you know, go ahead and continue doing this. And he's like, are you sure? I don't want to step on your toes. And 
Major West like, like, dude, we're running the game in your father's basement. Yeah, you're good. Go ahead and play the game. Do the thing. We're just fine. Uh, I've been told uh, that Mr. Arneson actually didn't feel proper continuing the Banana Republic or the actual Braunstein version of it in the uh, West Germany city. So he kind of made his own thing. And this is where the birth of Blackmore came from. Just like there was Brownstone, and there's the Latin version of the Brownstone, and there's Braunstein. He created Blackmore. And uh, shortly after that, it got introduced to um, Gary Gygax at one of the Gen Cons. Uh, and that was when uh, Gary went and made, or Mr. Gygax went and made Greyhawk. And you start to see this little color theme show up with many other things and that's kind of like the fun of like this this time period they kind of showed that uh homage you said a little honoring of the original in this case now let's go ahead and go all the way back to the original i went and didn't open with this because there's a lot to say in the very beginning but dave uh wesley's first uh inspiration came from a book called Stratego. I'm having a little bit of a problem saying that word. But it's uh, wrote by Charles Totten, which, interestingly enough, in German, Tot means, uh, Totten means death, which is kind of a weird thing. Apparently, he was a military, a U.S. military uh, commander that taught war games um, back in, like, the 1800s. In 1880, he created this book called Stratego. Uh, Trigos. Anyways, I'll have a link for it, and there's a picture course coming across right now. And you can actually get this book on um, Amazon. Now, I don't have an affiliate with Amazon, but there is a link down there for Amazon, and you can see that there. Um, and another game that really inspired uh, Major Wesley was this other one, uh, talking about the strategy uh, for games, essentially. And I'll go ahead and link that one too, and you can see that right there. Um, and that's kind of where all this came about. So the year is 1971. Um, Major Wesley's inspirations have caused Brownstein to be kicking off in a big way. Um, he has to go to war. He is going to Vietnam. He spends three years there. He comes back in 1974. He comes back to basically uh, D&D &D being made also in 1974. Uh, Dungeon and Dragons was being made by Mr. Gygax and Dave Arneson. Uh, Mr. Arneson is running Blackmore uh, in a Brownstein type of manner. Uh, everything is great. Uh, Greyhawk is more fantasy. Brownstein is uh, more historical. And uh, Blackmore is more actual like sci-fi. Um, but What's interestingly enough about that, though, is Arneson and Wesley actually preferred uh, Tolkien's work better or more than uh, Gygax. I'm, I know Gygax read it, and I'm sure he liked it, but I don't think he liked some of the elements. They just some of they just bothered him. He's been referred to as saying that he didn't like, especially the elves. So it, he really was poo pooing on the the halflings in, in that game. But that's going down a road we don't need to go into at this moment in time. Okay, so I've talked about this, and I'm going to put this in the middle here so people have to kind of find it, though it probably will be sectioned out by time. Where and how did Major Wesley almost kill Dave Arneson, and how did this all come around? Well, so Arneson was a huge fan of historical stuff, too, and... Uh, they both kind of like to practice different military things and were both into war gaming and that type of stuff. And they got special permission to go back and use these old, for that time, they were old, uh, fencing gear. So they had the foils, they had the, the fencing vests, the helmets, and all that type of stuff. They had all the protective gear. They had permission. They have the space to use it. Um, but they were amateurs. They didn't know the dance. They didn't know how to do it. They didn't know the parries and the deflections and how to angle your body so that you didn't get hurt and this type of stuff. And what ended up happening is due to the age of the gear potentially or the fact they were 
moving at the speeds they were moving and they both hit together like that. Boom. Uh, Major Wesley's foil went and got pushed and went like that and it broke. And when it did, it immediately shortened and got like that and it went straight into uh, Dave Arneson. And it went in the front and came out the back and literally the hilt slapped into the front of uh, Mr. Arneson and they both looked at each other like, uh-oh. And they looked down and there's blood starting to amass and starting to drip. So they freak out and Major Wesley pulls the uh, foil out, causing a noise from Mr. Arneson that was very unpleasant, I'm sure. And uh, when they got looking at it and they got the, the, the vest off and everything, the protective gear, it turns out he just got like a little flesh wound and they just basically took the and made this nice uh, laceration right next to the kidney ears. But if Wesley's aim had been a little more center mass, that probably would have been the end of it and would have been the co-founder that got uh, Gary Gygax into it. Now, as Wesley has said also, if it wasn't Gygax or if it wasn't Arneson, it probably would have been someone else. There was a lot of people at that point in time, kind of like uh, Flight uh, with the Riley brothers. Uh, there was a lot of people doing that. If it wasn't them, it would have been someone within the relatively near future probably. So, But I am very happy it happened the way it did. It was a near miss, and we had Mr. Arneson as long as we had him. So one of the things that Wesley, Major Wesley talked about in – the interview was how do you market something like this you know he didn't want to go back and use the role play because that kind of had the wrong idea of what this was he didn't want that and he couldn't use anything D, &D related because that was like dungeons trademark and trademark dragons trademark you know tsr was going after everyone so he started looking at other stuff and you know, he looked at uh, uh, a, a, one of the, the ideas that were being thrown around was interactive fantasy. But then, boom, there was an interactive fantasy magazine. So it was an like interactive trademark, fantasy trademark. And then they were like adventure gaming. And they were like, nope. Very soon after that, they came out with adventure gaming magazine. And that became that. Uh, and then... They came out with, uh, you know, um, the Choose Your Own Adventures. And not only was that a title of a book series, but then that became a brand, which then went back to being a book series because it was ruled too general of a term. Because all the uh, Choose Your Own Adventures were calling themselves Choose Your Own Adventures. And that became a thing. Uh, so they ended up going back to a uh, role play game. And uh, it's not that role play games were inspired by psychology or anything of that nature or by the actors, um, but it was the one thing, and they called it a uh, they called it a scenes de fait, uh, which is French for uh, scenes to be made. Uh, if I got my pronunciation correctly which means that it basically can't be copyrighted because it's being used in the general market by everyone. So, like I said, you have several main key players in uh, these Bronsteins, one of which was Dave Arneson. Arneson was known for being very uh, bombastic and loud with things and doing many exciting things. One of the things that he did in the Banana Republic thing was he was started as a prisoner and as he's being flown away, he had all these pamphlets and he's like, I get points every time these pamphlets get given out, right? And he's like, yeah. So while he was flying away in a helicopter, he just like, boop, and dumped out all of his pamphlets, which just floated all over there like propaganda pamphlets and got that out to all these people. And he basically had a thousand points more than everyone else because of that. But many other people whose relations I probably haven't made yet or found yet because I'm looking at it from sort of like a narrow perspective at this point in time uh, or they read it differently or their understanding of Bronstein may never be known. Maybe these things are related or maybe they're just completely separate. But 
there are games that come out that are much more like Bronstein in nature. Uh, one of those games is called Vampire the Masquerade. Um, that game is run differently than Dungeons and Dragons. It's run very much. You go to a salon, your different vampires are there. You have different elements outside the vampires. Um, you have the werewolves, the mummies, the um, wraiths. You have, yeah, ghouls, all these type of things. Ma uh, magic users, magicians, you know, uh, and, you know, hunters in that way too. Uh, and all those are actually played both in pen and paper using D10s uh, specifically, um, but they're also done in LARP. And LARP, which is live action role play, is basically Braunstein. It is more Braunstein than uh, Vampire the Masquerade, and it's more Braunstein than basically everything else I can think of at this point in time being played. My understanding of this actually has grown a lot. And I think I'm actually going to do more of a Bronstein type game when I play with my daughter. I have a seven year old. I'm going to talk about this game a little bit more. You're going to see me draw it up and this type of stuff. I'm doing one of these uh, Gygax 75 challenges where I'm talking about this. Um, this will come out later. It's not out yet. Um, but in there I'm building something called the Coral Isles. And this is going to be a game I'm going to be playing with my uh, youngest daughter who's seven. And we're going to be doing more of this Bronstein type of thing because it's rules light and it basically puts all the rules on me, not on her. And that's going to be very important for a seven-year-old, in my opinion. So Mr. Gygax was so motivated by what he saw in the Bronstein games when he played the Gen Con that he went back and added uh, a 15-page addendment or addition to uh, his current game he had out called Chainmail, which was a war game, a different version of it, shall we say. And in this, he added a, a whole section for fantasy that was basically a Tolkien ripoff. And eventually they had to change several of the things because things like Ents and Hobbits were copyrighted and were not allowed to be used in that facet. Uh, this didn't happen until after... Um, D, D got released and literally they had Balrogs that had to be removed out. They had Hobbits that had to be renamed Halflings and all this type of stuff um, in the early uh, mid 70s. So sadly very few people actually know about Bronstein. Uh, they don't know about the impact it's had in many different games and genres and how many different people like the uh, the gentleman who made the uh, Empire of the Petal Throne uh, was a player in his games, uh, Dave Arneson, Gary Gygax, um, all these people were in there. Uh, McQuaid or whatever his name was, the guy who did Dungeon, the board game, which I'm going to be talking more about. I haven't done my full research on it, so right in this moment I forget his name. But um, he he is uh, he was a player in that. Uh, they All these guys played in this thing. Mr. Wesley, or Major Wesley was doing these games um, into the 2000s occasionally. Uh, like 2005 to like 2010, I want to say, he was doing these Bronsteins at these Gen Cons and that type of stuff. And even in 2017, he was working with another game company called Old House uh, Rules. And that's spelled O-L-D-E. And that website will be down below too. Uh, they are the ones who make the PDF in 2017. Like I said, it was a rewriting of the original rules, essentially. Um, and it talks about uh, the Bronstein uh, area. It doesn't talk about the Banana Republic, um, but it does talk about the Bronstein. And then they have made their own rules in addition dealing more with like a Roman-esque type of thing. Their particular book goes from like the four, uh, 4th century to the 15th century. Uh, well, I'll get into that in a second. So their way of doing it is a little bit different than what uh, Major Wesley was doing. Um, Major Wesley would have up to 20 people in several rooms. I guess it was like a full-on affair. You'd have food, drink, beverages, as a whole social gathering, that type of stuff. Uh, the way they recommend playing Bronstein now is like up to five people and having several NPCs. And there's probably more tools. And they talk about doing this via uh, Google Plus 
as a way to do this over the internet. Um, and it works really well, I guess. I haven't done that yet. However, I can see both ways of this being very solid. Um, I've heard of people doing this uh, where they create a blog and they'll have interaction on the blog in between the game sessions and then the GMs basically keep up with what's going on there and then they move on. And I've seen some pretty silly stuff. Uh, like there was a Ravenloft uh, one that uh, had cartoon characters essentially playing it out and someone played the mummy and someone played the vampire and someone played a were rat that was involved and all that type of stuff and basically it was a much smaller thing i heard of a attempt to do one in a sci-fi saying but the problem they ran into was that they were each controlling their own galaxies and the friction between players was not there enough and it basically became like 12 different solo games and um there was no demand for resources because they all had their own in their own galaxy. So you really had to be like titans of the galaxies to try and expand beyond your own galaxy. Um, if they were to remake that, the thought was that they would do it all in one galaxy. Okay, guys, we're going to switch this up just a little bit real quick here. Um, I had to take a break coming back to it. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into how you play the game. Um, so when you get uh, when you get the game built and you got the characters designed and you got like eight or so characters or whatever, now you need to go ahead and build a centralized town or location or place where all this is going on. Then you need like a couple places of adventure where variables could happen. You could go in there and find something that could be useful. You could go in there and just waste your time. You could go in there and potentially die. All these type of things could happen. Um, but that's part of the game too that's uh why it's not so straightforward as all these other things depending on which direction the party went maybe a group of people would get together and go do this thing or one person would try and do this by themselves okay you get the general idea so in general uh, the game is played in theater of mine or at least somewhere around there. You might be using miniatures to represent like what building you're in or whatever's going on so that uh, things can happen across the board and people no need to know where you are in relation to other things and that type of thing. Exact movement with like five grid squares was not exactly a thing they were doing back then. Um, in general, you used uh, D6s, uh, usually 2D6 to accomplish some tasks. Um, there would be like a difficulty number that you would reach to, and then that would be how uh, you determine many things. Okay, so there are, Major Wesley never really fully identified this. In a more modern uh, way of looking at this, I, I could come up with different things to describe this. Uh, mostly that there's really only one stat. Um, the stat is luck. Um, after that, you have other things that affect luck. But luck is your hit points. Luck is your ability to avoid things. Essentially, these would be truly your hero points of how heroic you can be. And the more luck you have, the more heroic you are, the more damage you can take. But you can't take both damage and do really cool things at the same time which is why it would probably fall more into the hero point versus hit point or health point, um, as the older editions would say they would do. So one of the traits, per se, that you could have would be literacy. Are you literate in your own language? Can you read and write? Are you able to understand these things? It's not clear whether this free thing is a thing you want. I say free because it doesn't cost you anything it's a decision. You decide whether you want to be literate or not. Being literate means something. It means that you're more educated. It means that you have more ability to do um, other smart things like be literate in other languages, that type of stuff. Um, but not being literate, being illiterate, gives you two extra points of luck at the beginning of the game. It also gives you a few other things. But having two more points of luck at the beginning of the game is not just two more, I'm going to say, hits or damage that you can absorb. It is also um, your, it also affects your armor class because your armor class is directly related to the number of luck you have. 
So if you go from 10 luck, the starting luck, to 12 luck, well, then you actually 10% of that is not 1, it's 1 1.2. And in this game, you always round up. So 1.2 becomes 2. So armor doesn't absorb one more point of damage. It actually absorbs two more points of damage if you're illiterate versus if you are illiterate. So there's a lot of times when that becomes uh, important. However, if you're literate with a shield, it doesn't matter. The shield just absorbs one hit point, uh, one attack up to three damage. Or, you know, if you're illiterate, it doesn't matter. Still does the same thing. So there are, um, there are what what would you say? There are uh, there's no clear reason for or for against it. It is purely your play style. You know what you want to fit in with certain roles require you to be literate it's hard to be a noble and to be illiterate it's hard to be a commoner and be literate uh, it is not impossible to be either one of those things with that however if you're the chancellor at school you're probably literate if you're the mayor of a town you're probably literate you're probably not going to find any illiterate town people however the viking coming into town that might be illiterate so you can understand how that goes. Okay, so once you kind of picked your role and picked whether you're literate or not and what type of armor and weapons and this type of stuff you want, in which there are some small differences between these things, um, you need to describe your character in about 25 words or less. Uh, here's an example of that here. Like I was talking about with uh, armor and shields and this type of stuff, um, you can start with armor um, if you do, you get 10% of your luck and basically bonus damage you can absorb, um, regardless of the type of armor. You can go with additional, there are, let me change that, there are advanced rules for having different type of armor. This armor, the 10% armor, would be considered um, the light armor. Light armor allows you to do certain things like climb, allows you to jump over things, fit into narrow passageways, be more flexible. Whereas you cannot swim at all if you're wearing armor of any type. It's just uh, you're not doing it. So in the example with the river that I was talking about before, if you were an armored foot troop, you could not swim that river. If you were not armored, you would be able to swim that river and be able to get across to the other side. So again, there are no clear answers. Um, being armored has its benefits. Having shield has its benefits. You can throw a shield across the river. You could then swim across, but you can't be armored with a and swim across. I, I don't even think technically you could tie a shield to your back. Though maybe I could see that maybe, um, but I think they kind of fall in the same category. Now you can find armor. You can defeat your opponent, take his armor, and use it. However, there's only a one in six chance that that armor is going to be usable by you without repairs. Repairs take time. Repairs are not on Mac. When your armor gets used and gets damaged to get repair, takes armor, takes time, takes money, so on and so on. You start with a certain amount of uh, coins that you can go ahead and use to build up your character. You can find more to get more armor, to get other things, um, so on and so on. In the basic rules, um, weapons break down into one of four different categories. You have bow, which is basically anything ranged. You have one-handed, you have uh, two-handed, and then you have uh, thrown melee, which means that it is a melee weapon that is then hurled. So it could be a dagger, it could be an axe, it could be whatever. You could have a ninja sword, but it's still going to count as a one-handed sword. There are no specialty benefits for whatever you're not there's no improved weapon speed because it's just a weapon we're not trying to get that detailed you know what i'm saying but we want you to have fun and have those things equipment is pretty simple too um you can hold up to uh 15 items inside a backpack um the things basically have to be able to fit into a backpack this counts as up to a thousand coins this counts up to so many gallons of water um, uh, so many days of food you get the general idea now you as a character a person can carry 20 things your backpack counts as one 
uh, your weapons, I believe, count as another, so on and so on. And uh, that's how, or maybe it's the weapon past the first, counts as one. And then that's basically how that goes. Uh, so starting coins, I talked about you start with a certain amount of coins. In this game, uh, everything is based on a silver piece. It's a D6 times 10 silver pieces um, as far as D&D-like games go. Uh, this is far more realistic than starting with gold um, because silver was a much more common currency back in this day, I would say. The way things were priced back then is a little weird. Um, so it would be based on a D6. Uh, that would uh, introduce scarcity and whatnot. Basically, you remember the role. So, uh, you know, maybe there's an extra armor smith there and repairs are super cheap this time. Uh, maybe lamb meat is super expensive because whatever reason there's no lambs that have been slaughtered uh, so it's a bit variant it's based on a d6 roll flat essentially and that's how many silver pieces it costs very quick to get it out there uh, maybe not extremely realistic if that makes sense character sheets are really uh, general and basic uh, here's what one would look like you can see here uh, it basically has all the important stuff and none of the other stuff, essentially. Okay, so now that you've got a character, you're interacting with your GM's world, uh, there are different tasks you can do. The GM will establish whether it's a simple and easy and moderate, difficult or impossible challenge. Impossible literally means there's no need in rolling. And then you can see the difficulties on these other ones. Um, there are ways to get pluses and minuses to this. I'll get into that in a little bit, but pushing with luck is one of those ways. So I talked about pushing. Uh, it's also something like you could be something like that could be considered a feat of strength, um, kind of like Leonidas when he dropped everything else and he focused specifically on it and the world disappeared so he could strike uh, King Xerxes of the Prussian army and just to draw blood. Uh, that same type of thing uh, can be done by spending luck. Um, you can add that bonus after uh, you roll the dice to see if you hit to then try and push your luck or have a feat of strength, shall we say. Combat is super quick and simple. You roll a d6 for initiative. Um, you go into melee. Uh, you shoot things, whatever. You roll your 2d6, see how you do. Um, and that tells you whether uh, you do nothing. You do one point of damage, you do two point of damage, and... Then there, when you get to advanced rolls, you can actually do three points of damage on certain rolls. Um, that is where the max damage comes into this. Um, to prevent the damage coming onto you, you spend a point of luck. So 10 points of luck quickly goes away when it's also your uh, health pool. Um, like So if you get hit for two points of damage, well, guess what? You just spent two of your luck to prevent yourself from dying. You have one life. You have one hit point when you go to zero you die uh, regaining luck uh, happens one per day unless you happen to be at inn or a hotel or something like that being taken care of and then you get back a d6 uh, luck per day so if you happen to have armor and a shield you can choose to use your shield to block or not for example if your armor is already going to be destroyed or you're going to take a big hit you can choose to block with uh, up to three points with your shield and then your shield is rendered damaged um, or you can just decide to take the hit and then use luck to heal it so interestingly enough um, natural hazards and traps mechanical traps are uh, significantly more dangerous than melee combat is or any sort of really combat um, most uh, like drowning does a d6 damage when you're drowning um, so you really go through that pretty quickly uh, fire does a d6 you know certain other things uh, will do 2d6 damage which is absolutely mind-blowing it's basically instant death um, so they really had a heavy toll um, on this type of thing whereas a shield can also sometimes be used depending on the type of trap to stop the damage as well, but it will absorb up to three points of damage. So how does XP work? How does a character level up? What what happens? Well, again, this is frankly just as simple as everything else. A uh, character existing does absolutely nothing in the game, gets a point of XP. Okay, You get 10 XP, you, you level up, you gain a point of luck. That's how it happens. Okay, what can you do beyond that? 
Well, uh, there's a chart essentially. Whenever you uh, complete a task, whenever you start a task, whenever you kill a certain thing, um, those are all things that give you XP to level you faster. Some of the things you can spend your XP on besides luck, if you're wanting to, is that you can become uh, able to understand and speak other languages. Um, this is a uh, thing to help you in uh, long-term games where you're in an area where other languages are being spoke. If this is like over a couple nights, obviously it doesn't make sense. But if you were to spend uh, several months here, you might come out here learning more than just Latin if you're in an area that is pre predominantly Latin. So it's recommended when you're playing this game, uh, and you're doing all these tasks, going into dungeons, these type of things, avoiding traps, that you use a piece of graph paper, pencil, draw us out so you know where things are at. Um, oftentimes, unless a trap has been reset, that trap is sprung. So you can't be hit by the same trap twice. That is a benefit uh, compared to maybe some other systems. So if the person before you sets off the trap, then the person after him doesn't have to deal with it generally. So traveling. You want to travel from one location to another location, no problem. Uh, you can travel uh, one mile uh, per hour or two miles per hour if you're double moving. You can double move at a maximum, um, a maximum of 20 miles a day, so 10 times a day. But that would cause exhaustion, giving you a neg one to all actions for that until you get that healed through a significant rest or whatever. So NPC uh, NPCs can be both helpful and hurtful. You might run into bandits. You might run into to an evil guy when you're good. You might run into a good guy when you're evil. Um, but outside of that, the world is still realistic. There are uh, both beasts of burden and there are things that, that fall under what they call tooth and claw. And these are things like bears and wolves and that type of stuff. These are also pretty terrifying. They have, most of the time, they're really fast. They have a lot of luck, and they uh, are going to hurt you. They have bonuses to their uh, damage and to hit roll, shall we say. So another thing that has come out is um, you can get firearms. If you're in a modern enough game, or maybe your game is a fantasy setting and, or a sci-fi setting, and it has some sort of range attack, like an Arbitrus or a laser gun or whatever, um, there are rules for that in here. They just kind of recommend that getting powerful at distances uh, can be, uh, it can imbalance the game pretty quickly. So part of the reason why people like to go into these dungeons and to look for things is that they find more than coins, you know, and you can get gems and jewelry. Even back then, those were more valuable. If you had a piece of jewelry that was worth more than a thousand uh, silver pieces, then that piece of jewelry was worth not selling because it would cost you two slots to put the coins or it costs you one slot for the piece of jewelry. So advanced rules are going to make it more complicated, more detailed, and uh, maybe a little harder for a new player to follow along. So having this is fine, but you may want newer players to play with the more basic rules and then try and warp um, the advanced rules around them, so like keep them in a protective bubble until they understand things. So heavy armor has less movement, but it offers more protection, for example. Uh, shields can be used to absorb three points of damage versus one hit uh, up to three points. So you can go ahead and spread that out over a couple hits, for example. The use of war horses might be uh, something to use. Siege weapons. Um, if you do these type of things, you might have historical battles where it's more complicated. The outcome is determined, which means you might be going, you are, might be going to lose just because of the side you're on. So at some point in time, you have to think about survival versus just playing the game. If you have siege items, you might have something with storming the walls. Storming the war walls is an action. You might have other things, since you have siege engine, they might have catapults. And then you might have catastrophic damage if you got hit by a catapult directly. And of course, then there are other types of siege things like rams, siege towers, uh, tunneling, just to name a few of those things. 
in these advanced rules, if you have all the siege type of stuff going on, archers behind walls are uh, limitless and very deadly. Essentially, if you're not controlling that space or have destroyed it with catapults, then it's considered to be occupied with archers who are raining down arrows upon you. So, uh, if you're going to have that, then castles probably have their own defenses. They might have gatehouses, drawbridges, moats. Now, again, let's think about this, what we were talking about before. If you have armor, you can't swim. Thus making a moat that much more devastating. If you're in a more modern game, closer to the 1500s, you might have engineers. And if you have engineers, then you might have more modern type of other weapons like ballista, trebuchets, the battling rams versus just rams. Um, you know, the whole things with the towers and all that, boiling oil, these type of things. All these might be a new thing that you have to deal with. Also in historical battles, you might run into things like the Black Plague or other plagues, the influenza type stuff. Um, but you, and those can be very devastating and they have rules specifically for that in what you run into. The PDF takes like a moment in here to gently remind people that if the game gets in the way of the game uh, side, on the side of fun, basically, not to overly complicate a simple sentence. Personally, I like the special weapon damage because I like my weapons doing more than just straight damage for all types. So two-handed weapons have some sort of benefit. Uh, One-handed weapons have some sort of benefit. Certain weapons are both a melee thrown weapon and a melee weapon, um, and they have different things. Some weapons have maybe more reach, but are considered to be not a two-handed weapon, though they require two hands. Uh, so you do some trade-offs, and I like that. Also, there's wielding weapons in both hands versus a shield and that type of stuff. This also gets into the realm of maybe you have magic. Um, if you have magic, what kind of magic do you have? Um, you know, the game recommends and suggests uh, definition magic. That's a base. Um, they counter that with the church really doesn't like magic. It doesn't like divination magic especially. So um, in the uh, divination magic, they have all these things, the types, and how long it takes, and the sacrifices or ritual costs of things. And it gives you what you can learn uh, without having to be there, which could be very powerful. Also, if you're the person being able to do this and not everyone can do this, then that makes you a very important person. Also, clergy who have the ability to do blessings instantly become more popular or have reasons to be there. And they have their chart for how much they charge for this and how much of it goes to the church and all this type of stuff. And also, a person receiving a blessing if a really high roll is rolled, could actually receive a divination within the blessing itself because this actually does affect certain things. And all blessings basically last for a day and give you a plus one, uh, like you're pushing luck all the time. I remember earlier when I talked about this chart can be flexible and there's ways you can get pluses. This is an additional way you can get pluses beyond the pushing of luck. Okay, guys. So I've kind of gone over the rules, I kind of gone over how combat works. You kind of seen a lot of things. Uh, I'm going to leave some of this stuff vague because I do want to encourage you guys to go look at the website, buy the PDF and watch the interview. Um, at the very back of the PDF, he talks about um, the history of Bronstein. Again, I think it's a really great thing to read. Uh, lots of information in there really fills the setting. And even if you don't use that, maybe you can use that as inspiration for how you build your world whenever you try and do a Bronstein game or a game like Bronstein and you just make it your own homebrew world. Okay, guys, so um, down below, I'm going to go ahead and put my Facebook link. If you want to talk to me about how this inspired you, write in the comments below, go to my Facebook, talk about it there on my wall and I'll go ahead and respond back and forth with you guys. I generally respond to 100% of the comments given to me. I like to hear your guys feedback. If you got inspired in this, I'm going to ask that below this video you go and write the inspiration of how this made how this inspired you so that others can see how this video helped them or helped other people make something in this world. I I would love to see that personally. If you feel uh, like you I've earned it or you feel like this is a thing that you'd want to do, I'd appreciate if you liked 
this video and maybe share it to some of your friends who may not know that this is like one of the true grand, as I say, the grandfather of role play games, the true early beginnings of this type of thing. So I look forward to seeing you guys. I'll talk to you guys in the next video and keep rolling those dice. Bye.